Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is the debrief. We're back with a, uh, a top quality episode. We hope we've got table predictors. We've got running fixtures that we're going to be discussing. We've got Leeds versus Leicester. We've got loanee discussion, financial discussion. We're getting our accountant heads on for this one. We have got an accountant in the building, actually, thinking about it. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to get the fellas uh, involved now, everybody. I'll just get into a few of your comments before we get uh, into it. Benj, Benjo, 1983, shocking pronunciation of your name there, mate, but make it simpler. Yeah? Uh, good evening to all. Hey, mate. Uh, good evening. Uh, members are in the building. Chris is here and all marching on together. Uh, Woody says, hurry up, Connor. I'm taking the missus out for a meal. Where are you taking her, Woody? Let us know, mate. Let us know. Uh, generally, it's awful to be relegated. Yes. But look at what we're building on the 49ers. Love the ethos of the club. Passionate, hardworking, talented team. So much potential. It's a good uh, start. Hey, Brenda. Hello, 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 everyone. Um, Hill, uh, Ethan's in the building. Hi, Ethan. Um, let's get into it, shall we? Uh, we've got um, like lads in the building, uh, Gabe and Oscar. Uh, how are we doing, fellas? Gabe, all good, mate? Yeah, all good. Oscar, how are we doing? Yeah, good man, good. That is a show, by the way. The likely lads. That is that is gold. That's prime gold. That mate. Honestly, <laughs> that's a class program. That to be fair. Good man. I want to know yeah. where Woody's taking his misses. Yeah, he's in, I Lan- do. Well, he's in look, Woody, Woody, Woody's in Lanzarote. Shout out to you, mate. Um, Logan says, "Let's have a party." Yeah. If you're bringing the booze, Logan, I'm there, mate. Uh, Ronnie Kippering says, "We back evening, lads. How are we all doing? We're all good, mate. We're all good." Um, Oscar, uh, what's new, mate? What's new on the? On the Marriott sphere, anything? Are you are you still buzzing about Leeds United? Is it is it is it helping your day to day routine a little bit at this moment in time? Certainly is, certainly is. It was easier than it was this time last year. There's no doubt about that. But yeah, mate, just cautiously optimistic. Although when we get to the table prediction, maybe that maybe goes a little bit out of the window. But yeah, I'm optimistic, mate. Decent win at the weekend, but you know it's a long, long way still to go, mate. Long, long way still to go. <sighs> Yeah, it is indeed. Uh, yeah, smash a like, everybody. Yes, but we do have a, an accountant in orange up there. It's got to uh, be Oscar. <laughs> yeah, we'll so it's not me or Gabe. I feel that I'd have Certainly come out. not. <laughs> Certainly not Connor. <laughs> yeah, me and uh, me and numbers don't go to, uh, to together that well, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, keep getting your comments in, everybody. We're going to make this interactive. Um, obviously, we're going to be speaking a lot about the table, the running, all this sort of stuff. But I wanted to get the um, the sort of temperature right now and me and Gabe have been speaking about it quite uh, frequently on the Patreon and just like behind the scenes as well and I know on our group chat we've been speaking about it as well and me and Oscar might be bringing something to the Patreon account which is quite exciting but let's get on to the race between Leeds and Leicester City Oscar um where do we see Leicester City right now uh, let me just bring in the sort of uh point side of things when it comes to the Premier League obviously there looks like there's going to be some financial restrictions over Leicester City if they get back to the Premier League um you know they've, they've borrowed a lot of money from banks uh, over the, uh, a long period of time as well and, and it seems like when they get to back to the Premier League there could be some deductions some charges so do we do we believe that's going to affect any said mentality at this moment in time or is that just almost uh hysterical thinking right now certainly puts more pressure on them. There's no question about that. Um, obviously, six points is what it's looking like at this moment in time. But whenever that is going to come into play, who knows? It's obviously not going to come into play this season. But I think if you don't go up after being like 17 points clear of the rest of the league, and then you're going to get hit with a six-point deduction after that as well, I think your mentality, the whole positivity around the club has just disappeared if there is any positivity at the club at this moment in time obviously the, the form Leicester are on is pretty poor uh, the Leicester fans I know of which I know quite a few are genuinely genuinely really worried they're going to drop into thirds and going to get I won't say exactly what they said because I don't want to get it demonetized but S-housed by West Brom or Norwich in the playoff semi-final despite finishing like probably 30 points ahead of them um, you know it happened to us against Derby all them years ago 2019 it's certainly a worry for Leicester. There's no doubt about it. I still think Leicester will get top two. I think ultimately they have shown enough over the season. Yes, they're on a shocking run of form, but there's enough players there for me to get Leicester over the line. You know, your Jamie Vardy's, your Jewsbury Halls, your Fatawoos, your Mavididis at the back as well. Well, Vote Faz, um, you know, Pereira. There's a lot of not just know how, just quality. Well, a combination of know how, quality, and just application and consistency, you know, over the whole season, they don't let you down those players. So I still think Leicester 
Although I think Maresca will feel the pressure, I don't think the players on the pitch will. I think your Dewsbury Halls and your Vardys, they get you through the tough situations. You know, how many times has Vardy been in these situations? You know, promotion battles, title wins in 2016, relegation battles the year before that. You know, Fights for his life in pubs, you know? What was that? I didn't hear it. What was that bit was about pubs? In fights for his life in pubs. I mean, yeah, Vardy, yeah, he's, I know, he's yeah, everything. that's it. He's, he, he, he's just a born fighter. Not always in the most positive way, but you know, let's hope. Let's hope he starts fighting with his teammates rather than fighting for wins on the pitch. You, you could see it. There is a chance Leicester could implode. I think it will go one of two ways. I don't think it'll just be a straight down the middle. They'll either cruise to it or completely fall off. I honestly can't see it going any other way than that. I just feel they're in that kind of stage of the season where. They've had the biggest wobble by far. We'll see what happens. But in terms of next season, yeah, six points. If you're getting promoted and then you're getting done six points as a newly promoted club, especially knowing the quality of the Premier League these days, that's that's tough. There's no question about it. At some point, it's going to affect Leicester. The financial model of Leicester, King Power, has always been high risk. And I think since King Power have come into Leicester, when they were kind of mid-table in the championship, they've always been on the rise up until... 2022 really um so it's definitely a new kind of test for them not just on the pitch but off the pitch as well in terms of how they finance the club obviously they had the big sale of james madison in the summer if they didn't go up just going to that theoretical if they didn't go up Dewsbury hall's value absolutely plummets doesn't it let's be honest it absolutely plummets he will not stay in the championship and premier league clubs know that so definitely and you're looking at outside of Dewsbury Hall, who else is really bringing in the big books? Big books like a James Madison? I don't see it in that Leicester squad. So definitely a lot of pressure on Leicester at this stage of the season. I don't know Leeds' exact situation, but I don't think it's got as much rising on it as what it has for Leicester. We could still get a points deduction. with the So with the new rules they've proposed to scrap you know, the sustainability and fair play stuff from before. Season, and now, what's that? This season. No, it'd be for next season. Um, they're they're going to scrap the whole rules. Uh, it looks like and go to a whole new model, um, where in which you have a certain percentage of your revenue that you can spend, and it's it's it, look, it's only going to favor the top four or five teams even more. Uh, so we don't have to get into all that today because I don't think it's been ratified yet. But it looks like that's where it's going, and it's it's even worse than FFP in, in my opinion. Um, the current system of FFP. Um, to the, to the point of, you know, where you're at, if you're Lester, I think you're very similar to, obviously they had this massive lead, so they're not going to be feeling the same, but for the other teams in it, and you think about the, the form that Ipswich took, they had a really difficult time and they've, boy, have they turned that, that around. You have four horses running really, really fast. I know Lester has slowed down significantly, but you, you would expect them to get back to their best. Um, and I'm looking at the next the next number of matches. And for me, it's, I can see it going so many different ways. It's really about can Leeds sustain our, our speed right now and our speed being our win rate, because it's, you have to think, I mean, this is a historic run. It, things don't last forever, you know, one way or another. And with Southampton, they've had hiccups, um, but they're within striking distance. Ipswich somehow managed to keep doing it, defying the odds of reason and whatever uh, um, whatever magician they have in the changing room that's casting spells on the other teams, but I hope it keeps going for them uh, for their sake if they want to get up. So I don't know. I think the margins are so slim. It's really going to come down to you know who trips up first or the most. Or I mean, it could be that all these teams perform at a really high level. And it comes down to the last week of the season. You know, imagine that. Um, any other season, I think all four are in promotion form automatic promotion form so it's it's pretty wild it's uh on one hand i'm really enjoying it because it creates some real drama on the other hand i hate it because it creates some real drama (laughs) yeah if it, if it, 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 it does feel like two successive losses for any one of them could and do they're it. out and they're out i, I think that's yeah. how it's going to be I, I, we I'll can have be a week honest. connor where everybody loses like i'm at like and what yeah. will that it'll make no difference you know like yeah. it's but I, everybody I, I, wins that's what well. happened in 2019 I, we got beat by wigan and brentford in a free day spell and at that point we were in pole position before it before the wigan game kicked off we were in absolute pole position and after that brentford game it was effectively it was over so i do totally agree there connor 
I think I I don't think it's I, um, I mean we'll get onto it in terms of like the table predictor uh, at, at some point as well. But um, are we have uh, I think Gabe's mentioned it as well on one of our Patreon podcasts. But I don't think looking at this running, it's going to come down to the last game of the season. I don't think it's going to be a shootout between Leeds and Southampton. I personally think it's going to be done by then. Um, I think I, it's I all ju- going to be done. Like 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 our ter- table, it, our automatic terms- promotion will be assured. Yeah, in terms of really? top, well, I think top two. Yeah, I think top two will be wow. done by then. I think there's, I there's so. two. Be great. Yeah, it would be great. And, and I'd be interested to know what everybody in the chat thinks about that. Um, Oscar, I mean, obviously we'll get into the table predictors in just a little bit, but and we keep saying that. I'm but get, I'm, I'm going to get called Ty with my table predictor because I've got no, but no, but, no, but but I think I think the important thing is, mate. Like, obviously we we'll, we'll get into it at the end because um, I'm obviously interested to get Gabe's thoughts on ours as well. But um, I think. The interesting side of it is, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you the direct question, do you think it's going to come down to the last say, day of the season? Do you think it's going to be a three-point swing or do you think it, it's going to be done by then? Seeing your table predictor, you think it's already going to be done by then? But I mean, the table predictor, you can do that at Premier League level because you've got, got a rough idea. Arsenal, you know roughly what they're going to do. But at this level, trying to do a table predictor is, I think I said to you before, it's it's nigh on impossible. Um you know, in terms of just how, you know, who saw Leicester getting beat at home to QPR and then Middlesbrough just, and then obviously they've responded with some decent results, you know, sort of either side of that as well. You just don't see it. Who saw us drawing away at Huddersfield down to 10 men? You know, it's so difficult to predict. What I will say is I can see one of the four teams just running away. I really can see it, you know, in terms of running away and just winning the league. But second to third, I do think we'll finish. We'll be on the last game of the season. I do. I'm not saying we'll necessarily be involved, but I do think second to third. I just can't see two of the teams pulling away from from the, the rest of the pack. Can that we project good. Oscar's table? Because I want everybody to see it. Oh, I see. I'm going to get scored tie. I'm gonna get I to want everyone to see it. Too- Tangibly. Too positive. Can, can can someone can someone tell me where um just for my uh, mind stakes I don't actually know when it is when is Easter weekend what date is that because I've got a Thursday, date in my... I think it's 29th is Good Friday so so that is the weekend if you look at the fixtures that mm. could be where it's won and lost because that yeah. weekend is huge Connor's uh, a man for, of faith for as for you can all time. imagine very yeah. devoted yeah. to being in church. Yeah, Watford yeah. and Hull. Yeah, well, I know Watford aren't on a great run, but Watford away, you know, is a tricky place to go. You know, if you've seen a couple of teams this season slip up there, you know, around where we are in the league. I think Samson only drew there a few weeks ago. And obviously Hull at home. Hull have picked points off everyone. You know, Leicester, Ul, Samson, you know, that is a tricky game. You know, Phil, you know, coming up against people like Philogene and Carvalho in a game you've got to win where spaces might open up, that could be a really awkward game for us, that home game against Hull. But I just nevertheless, think, on the predictor, I predicted easy leads win. So, you know. You, you yeah, did. I was going to say, tough. I think it's going to come down to for Leicester. I think we're going to see what's happening with them sooner rather than later. I mean, they have the cup tie against Chelsea. And they come out and they're playing um, Bristol City and then they have Norwich. After that, they have three games that should be relatively easy for them. They've got uh, Birmingham City. They've got Millwall. And they've got uh, uh, Plymouth Argyle. Um if only we could play Plymouth Argyle another three times in a row, it'd be awesome. Um, but uh, after that, things get a little bit tougher. Um, but if they don't take max points from those games, you have to think those sort of easier games, you have to think that if you're a betting man, you would bet that maybe they slide down into the uh, second or third, or maybe even the fourth position, depending on what Southampton do. Uh, so I think we're going to know kind of what they're made of relatively quickly. Um and we'll see. I mean, everybody gets a good day, a good period of rest, even them in the cup. I mean, they play Chelsea and then they have, I think, 12 days off. So, you know, it's going to be really fascinating, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and it's, it is, as well, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure that this is going to be a big impact on Leicester. Um, I think it's, it, it's sort of adding to what Gabe said, although I do think, Ipswich's form really links back to their January transfer window and some excellent additions uh, for where they are. I don't think a lot of those bodies would have been good additions for us, maybe Kiefer Moore. But, you know, you look at a Sami Ento, you look at, you look at Kiefer Moore, you look at Amari Hutchinson's form, who's been, I think it was young player or player of the month. Um, you know, Travis coming in, Blackburn's captain. They, they, are, they are huge additions for Blackburn. And I think we said it at the time that relative to where they are 
um, and their squad level, I think they probably had the best window. I don't think a lot of those players get into Southampton, Leicester leads, but I think relative to those, at their level and pushing them on Oscar, I thought it was a top window and there's sort of no coincidence there as to where their forms hit, which is six wins in seven. Absolutely, you know, and that, and that was the point that I definitely made. You know, I think I made it back in January. The signings Ipswich which made, we couldn't have made those signings because a we didn't really need those types of player and they didn't really add to what we already had. Um, you know, Kiefer Moore, I don't think would have got into our team. I don't think he would have suited our system as well as what he. Listen for Ipswich, he's been phenomenal, and it was obvious from the first minute he was going to suit it, Ipswich perfectly. It says that the role Hurst played in the first half of the season. Kiefer Moore does exactly that and he adds goals as well and aerial mm. threat. You know, he adds so much more than what Hurst does and Hurst has been a really important player for Ipswich in the first bit of the season. Sarmiento adds a little bit more goal threat to the to the wings. Travis obviously bolsters the midfield and yeah, the, Hutchinson obviously signed, I think, in the summer, didn't he? And didn't quite yeah. work for him in the first bit of the season. It took him a little bit time, of time to bed in. He's almost like a new signing for Ipswich. He's almost their equivalent for us um, of what Nonto's been for us. Um, you know, when do we get to see Oscars? I want to see Oscars team I know, so badly. When I said, I to, because he's complimenting he Ipswich like, so much, I want to see exactly how much higher than them he has his placing. When when I said one team's going to run away with it, I didn't specify which team's going to run away with it. But <laughs> um, but yeah, this Ipswich have done great business, and I never really felt Ipswich were out of it. I still think Ipswich will just about miss out, but it won't be by a lot, and I, I could sit, easily still see him getting top two. You You got to remember Ipswich. Out the four teams, they're the ones that have been and done it most recently. Yes, it's at League One level. I know that. I know that very clearly. But still, that mentality, being there, done that. We've seen teams before go from League One up, then Championship straight up into the Premier League. We've seen it happen before. Ipswich have been there and done that. McKenna's been there and done that. And they've made the right recruitment. And the players that have stepped up for him all season, Leif Davis, um, you know, now Kiefer Moore, um, you know, they're still stepping where's, up. Where's, where's Burns, Connor Chaplin? You had a bit of a mind block then, didn't you? Yeah, I yeah, know, yeah. Connor <laughs> Chaplin. I mean, you, you know Connor <laughs> Chaplin. Oscar's you know the only Chaplin. one we expect to rattle off the entire team sheet. You know Chaplin. Team. Chaplin. If I do it, I get three players there. out there and Connor's like, yeah, it's fine. If Oscar's <laughs> out there doing it, he has to name the starting the 11, first, team. second, third off the bench. You know? <laughs> I was going to mention Harry Clark was like, no, Harry Clark looked like Paul Connolly. So we have higher those. expectations of our accountant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Harry Clark, good shout. He's he's definitely going to be, if they do get up to the Premier League, he's definitely going to be one who they immediately replace. Oh, wow. Uh, um, so, uh, I, well, I'll get uh, my uh, sort of prediction, uh, my final uh, prediction right now. Uh, this is how I see it ending. Um, so I see Leicester. I think Leicester's turning it around and... Uh, in, in- not by much, Gabe. Not by much. If you look at that, dif- if you look at that difference between Leeds and Leicester, it's it's still probably the exact same points tally right now. Um, but if we just have a quick look up here, um, I've got sort of like last five games as all winning, which is going to make it completely tense. But I've got Leeds beating Southampton. Uh, you can do this on Leeds Live, by the way. But I think one of the fundamental ones I've got here is Hull beating Ipswich at home. Um, I'm trying to have a look at some others here. Like you look at this, <laughs> you look at this, <laughs> this, this period. This is, from this the, is a brownie, uh, a drawing on together. Um, yeah, but you look at these are all, there are a lot of big games here. Cardiff obviously taking three points off Ipswich at home. I've got them drawing at home to Southampton, Coventry, who are I think are going to be difficult. I've got them drawing um, against Ipswich, Leicester draw against West Brom. Obviously, that's that potentially. Could be what first versus fifth. West Brom are doing really well at the minute. I think Middlesbrough away will be a tough one for Leeds. I've not actually got us. I've not actually got us losing a game, guys. To be honest with don't you, don't think I did actually either. No, I've not got us losing a game, but I don't think I've got many of the others losing games as well. Norwich chips, which I've got a draw. Leeds, I've got drawing at Coventry. If I'm be to be ultra, yeah, right. ultra tough. I think we've got. We are going to drop points. I think sixth of April could be big for us. To be honest with you, but more draws here. Look, this is a this is a sort of a, a big one. You know, first of April. What we're on now, thirteenth of March. I've got Leicester drawing against Norwich. Norwich just climbing into sixth, doing really well at the minute. Ipswich and Southampton. I don't know what you're both thinking there, but probably a draw. And Leeds, Hull. I've been ultra cynical there, but I think that could be a tough one for us. But I could easily sway with Leeds winning that game. And then we're up to a 103 points, really, you know, if we are to win a game like that. So that's sort of how I'm seeing it, us beating Watford. I don't think there's going to be any surprises when we come back off the international break. 
and and this weekend. I don't think there's going to be any surprises either. So, I don't. I, what what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, I've got us scuppering a little bit at Middlesbrough, Coventry, Hull City. Do you, I mean, Gabe, I'll come to you first before we get on to Oscars. Do you think that's sort of realistic or? or yeah, I think that's a conservative projection. Yeah, I think it's it accounts that we're probably going to slow down with the win rate because you know we've been on a absurd. Uh, we've been on fire. Um, so I, I think it's a safe estimate. You know, it's it's really important not to think of these things in terms of the hot hand fallacy, this idea that because you've done it before, then you're going to continue to do it. That's why that's, people lose a lot of money in the stock market and in casinos that way. Of course, casinos are rigged and so is the stock market. Hey, but point being, look, this is prof- this is football. People get hurt. People get tired. We've talked about in other broadcasts how there are indications of maybe a drop in form of some players, even though we've ground out results. So there's lots of variables you need to consider. I think that um, I'm not necessarily in the camp that um, we have to win every game, but I would certainly like to. And I think that it is possible to be honest. Uh, when I look at the fixtures we have, I would also, to- I would also like to Gabe. that. Would yeah, be but nice. no, Connor, you don't want to see our team win. No, of course you get, not. you're not actually a, you're a Manchester City fan. Yeah, um, I, I won't get any views. I won't get any views then. So we've got to we've got to see Leeds lose. Of yeah, 100. percent Yeah, so so you can say that you're right. That's why you do this at the uh, the end of the day, so you can come you, on camera you, and tell people that you're right. You know um, me well. You know me well. <laughs> Clearly, I've read the narratives. Um, no, but point being, uh, look, I think that I'd rather be in our position than any of the other teams. So one of the commenters said that they all have to play each other. You know, Southampton, Ipswich, Leicester, they all have to play each other again. Those are tough, tough games. What we have to do is take care of business against inferior opponents until we we hit South hit Southampton. And to be honest, you know, the only reason you can make the debate that they're not inferior to us is because they've beaten us already, right? So uh, do I think we win every match? No, but I actually, I'd be disappointed if we drew to Coventry. I'd be, I'd be pissed off, so... Maybe I have us a little bit more bullish uh, than you do, but I think it's a reasonable projection. 103 points was it, or 101, or whatever you had. That was, that's it's a great haul. Yeah, we'd be on we'd be on 100 in second. Every single team would break the 90 point uh, breach, which would essentially mean it's the first time in Championship history. Um, it will be two teams haven't gone up above 90 points, which is, I mean, it is there is a likelihood here that at least three teams. <laughs> reach 100 points maybe Four teams could <laughs> breach 100 points and then this is where goal difference uh makes a, a big stand. but I, t- I tell you that you know, the interesting stat was i was looking at the table earlier on on the, on the pod and uh leads are actually the lowest scorers don't know if you both knew that and um, leads are actually the lowest scorers of the top four um they're all they're all clustered together really the others but leads are i think even norwich are on sort of 65 goals and we're on 68 but the staggering difference is it's Leeds' defensive display, uh, which is which is remarkably um, you know stand out ahead of, of of really any other team. I think that we're, we're yards ahead of Ipswich, and and do you know what? I think it's Southampton have only conceded. I think it's three less goals than Ipswich. Quite staggering that Oscar. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have put that there because we're all sort of seeing Ipswich and thinking, bloody hell, Ipswich are conceding so many goals. But so have Southampton up there as well is uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of that probably came from the start of the season, though, when they were obviously getting battered by Sunderland and, and couldn't really keep clean sheets to save their lives at the start of the season. Um, obviously, Russell Martin was getting a lot of stick for that. I don't think Russell Martin's ever been a particularly great defensive coach. I think you've seen that at Swansea, you've seen it at MK Dons, and obviously seen it now at Sampson. But, uh, but yeah, this, I think Sampson are better than Ipswich defensively, um, albeit you know, the stats will say different, but... Yeah, there's no question about it. Both Ipswich and Sampson are both going to have to tighten things up to get top two for me. Um, yeah, I, I do. Just, just, just having a just, just having a quick look here as well, Oscar. Some interesting results here. Southampton losing two one to Hull at home, losing two one to Millwall at home. Obviously, Liverpool putting three past them, which is understandable. But then four uh, three win. Your- just to say though, that's a young Liverpool team. It wasn't it wasn't a great Liverpool team? Like, yeah, yeah, true, correct? true. But then, then, then Oscar, you've got um, Birmingham, a uh, ten man Birmingham scoring three against them, and Sunderland scoring two against them. So we say at the start of the season, and, and quite right, you know, they, they they didn't have a good run. They were in the bottom half of the table. But on top of that as well, you know, recent form, the last six, they are conceding goals, and you compare that to a Leeds United, a, you know, an Ipswich and a Southampton to a Leeds United at this moment in time. It's night and day. And isn't it so true that the almost, you know, the 
the the sort of saying that um you build from the back it's just so it's been so imperative this season it really has and i've always said it on the channel my old man's always said it you build from the back you build on clean sheets 28 I mean, goals conceded all season yeah. 28 uh, uh, it's an astounding number by yeah. the way do you, do you know how many rather them have conceded <laughs> 128 77 God. which is more than, more than any of the team top team, teams have scored jesus <laughs> 77 yeah but it is it is also key to note that you know when we're looking at um when we're looking at Eli, even elan melier you know as a three here as a trio elan melier has definitely improved i mean gabe sort of convinced me the day that he's improved a little bit but what i would say is a lot of the time he's not really facing anything for the majority of the season he hasn't really faced anything the the dominance in terms of possession from Leeds United has kept the ball well away from his goal and you know that's another credit because to concede yeah. that amount of goals but for the ball not to really be anywhere near your goalkeeper for large portions of the season it's a big testament isn't it that's why all he had to do was slightly improve in some areas we didn't need him to fundamentally transform into a new new goalkeeper it was that he needed to the shots that the data should tell us he needed to save or that were reasonable saves, he's now making. Um, and when you have a lower utilization rate, it's easier to impact your, your metrics. Look, he went before Christmas from having a sub-63% save percentage to now having a 71 72% save percentage. And that's directly tied into him, A, making the saves that every keeper should make. And then he's made a few saves that some keepers don't, who, that have had a much higher XG uh, attached to them. Still, in terms of, and this speaks to Connor, the point, it's, it's less about tearing down Elon Melier, but uh, into this commenter's point, the, the the degree of difficulty he's facing and the XG on a lot of the qual on the chances that are coming against him, it's in like the bottom half, well down in the bottom half of the league. So the defense is doing a really good job at limiting chances against him, but it has to be said, Connor's right to say it, and I think we're, uh, we should all be in agreement that Elon Melier, in terms of what he's had to do as opposed to just conceding soft, weak stuff, he's done that a little bit less, and that's made a, a big impact. In you know, it's the difference between a draw and a win here and there, and that's really important in a race like this. I actually think Melier's been, I think since January, first of January, that Birmingham game where everyone kind of sort of went up another level. I think Melier has gone up quite a few levels, to be fair, in terms of shot stopping. There's, there was a few saves he's made where I thought there's just no chance he makes that save start of the season. The Sheffield Wednesday save, you know, at nil-nil. It's yeah, a stunning a save, one. to be fair. Yeah, it's not the most picturesque save, but he's read it really well. You know, there's been a few of those this season, a few against Huddersfield, um, obviously a lot against Stoke, where, you know... The Stoke chances, though, so I looked into this. Number one, don't want to take anything away from him. He has to make the saves, right? Six shots on goal, six saves, brilliant. Dis distance, though, weren't they? they were it wasn't just distance. It was, it was quality, too. They had, like, XGs attached to them, like, 0.18 and 0.25. That said, again, you have to save the stuff you face, and he's done it. And before, he wasn't doing it. So he was letting in, first half of the season, he was letting in some weak, weak goals. Now he's, yeah. he's trimmed that off a little bit, and that makes a huge difference in a push to promotion. And the set pieces as well. The set pieces, you know, it has been so much more decisive on crosses, you know, well, he's got big, bulky, six foot five centre backs standing in front of him, trying to, trying to step on his toes, and you know all sorts of different things. You know, targeting him almost in terms of the deliveries as well, right under his nose. He's dealing with those situations now. Oscar's like that maths teacher where the kid in class who doesn't get anything right stays in the back with him for a long, long time, and then when he when he does get a couple things right, like a couple of questions on the assignment, Oscar's like, "That's amazing! You've done that so well." <laughs> <laughs> over the season, over the season, I agree. But for me, you can't say he's not being at least seven and a half, eight out of ten since January. For me, you know, over the last three months, I mean, he's been really good. Uh, I'm not saying. Listen, the decisive factors. For five, is five, five is average. The decisive factors for where we are in the league are Joe Rode on Nampadu's consistency, Somerville, Rutter, Nonto, you know, Magic, and obviously Farker tactically. But Melier, giving credit where it's due, I think he's been certainly on his best run of form for the last two years. <laughs> Instance. But yes, maybe I went a little bit overboard. I'm it's being mean. Right. Look, he, he has improved. You're right. Um, he's not I, on the look, level of Hermanson for Leicester. I'm not he's not on. That. And the thing he's, is, though, this league is so chaotic uh, that there aren't a lot of goalkeepers that are putting up good numbers this season anyway. So in this league, so look, it's respectable to uh, to have your save percentage over seventy percent. It's not great. It's not going to turn anyone's head. But you know what? It's not. It's not bad anymore. And 
Like yeah. when he's facing shots that he should save, by and large, he's saving them. So uh, we'll talk about him next season if we get promoted, of course, or if we face another long season in the championship. But in terms of stopping the bleeding, um, I think he's done that, which is credit to him. That's not easy to do. So good for him. Yeah, 100%. Um, he's definitely shown uh, elements of uh, his game that are definitely developing. I, I, if I'm to be ultra critical, I don't know if I'm completely aligned with with Oscar from set pieces, but he has been, I guess, I guess it's another way of... Distribution uh, is still an issue, I'm not going to lie. It, it's still... Well, so it's crossed, still, this uh, crossing uh, numbers are... Abysmal. Uh, but so but let's let's let us let us not let's not go. I was just yeah, gonna, don't drag me down into this abyss. I'm trying to get positive. I was putting it. Listen, I was just I was just I was just going to put a simple cap on it and say, look, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with Oscar in terms of him from set pieces, but um, it's probably a different way of doing it. Listen, um, coming out and palming uh, instead of catching, I guess it's not it's not gone against us once. Um, so I guess you he's know, putting a cap on it, Oscar. You hear that? He's, he's putting cloud. a cap on it. If yeah, Oscar's I'll a math teacher, I'm, I'm the jaded this drama teacher issues. that thinks he should have been a professional actor. So I, have to, I, have to, I have to at least, I, I can't just come in and say, look, I disagree with Oscar and then just leave it. I have to at least <laughs> say why. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I well, agree. Thanks I for that, Oscar, but you're wrong. That's <laughs> yeah, I welcome, I welcome all opinions, but your opinion is wrong and mine yeah, is right. Categorically so wrong. <laughs> moving on. By the way, speaking of bad opinions, before you move on real quick, Bob Bevla, I like you. I don't know who you are. I've only seen this comment for the first time, but I, I would never just jump all, all all over somebody in the comment section. However, Verpo as a central attacking midfielder would be amazing. Please say more. Write more in the comments or tell me you're trolling. And if you are, I've taken the bait. I have yeah, taken it. Is. Congratulations. Mate, Bob's not Bob's not letting this one down. There's a few comments. So uh, yeah, uh, interesting there. Um, Gabe wants Kiko Kasim. <laughs> <laughs> That's the that is a, a, a horror show indictment on you, Gabe. That is, not, oh. that is a bad one. That mate. it's a bad it's, one. It's probably it's that that could, could that just could be, be it just could be a way to make my blood pressure go up. Which uh, yeah, that, that, good job, that, Michael. You have succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> you see the pain be, in my forehead. It's become a thrombose. Thank that you. Is, that, that could be the worst comment Gabe's ever received. Fair play. Oh, uh, fair play. There's another one here. Fair play. Furpo is a mid, not a defender. Fair enough, Chris. Fair enough. But let's move on from that. From that, please. We're not getting into a discussion of is Furpo a cam. Let's, let's drop Rutter and get Furpo yeah, in I'm there. Really <laughs> um, but yeah, it is. It is now, the lads. What I wanted to get on as well is we will touch on, on on Leicester just just in a little bit again when we when we round off the pod and stuff. But there's something that's been sort of uh, trending on the Leeds United sphere uh, at this moment in time, and I wanted to get both of your takes on it. It's about loan ease, and I know we've spoken on this before, but there seems to be like a few developments at this moment in time. There's a lot of uh, discussion around these players coming back in terms of Brendan Aronson, um, you know, uh, Jack Harrison, but there's been a few contrasting reports uh, this evening saying that, look, Rocker, Harrison and Aronson and uh, and Christensen will all be let go by the club, whatever happens in the summer. Um, listen, I want to get your thoughts on if you think they should be let go, uh, whatever whatever level we're at. Should we accept them back? Uh, there has been a lot of the, how do I say, the the the, the rat uh, connotation with a lot of these players, and they I should have be leaving. Say about that because because they're rats. Um, uh, Oscar, I know you're going to toe the line a little bit, mate, and um, be Geneva on this one. But what are your thoughts, mate? Would you take any of them back? Would you be selling them all on? Is there a certain player in there who you would incorporate into Premier League or Championship proceedings? Let's hope it's Premier League proceedings next season. Uh, what are your overall thoughts, bud? Well, Sinistera permanently has left the club. Sinistera was the only player out of the players that left that summer who I can genuinely say would improve our starting eleven. Like genuinely, I can't think of any of the other players who have left who I look at and think, yeah, they go in, they improve our start. Maybe Mark Rocker, but it, Mark Rocker's not going to come back to Leeds, I don't think personally. And is he going to fit the system? Is he going to block the pathway of someone like an Archie Gray and Ampadu? Yes. Is it worth it? No, for me. That's my honest opinion. Um, and I was someone who's probably a bit more on the fan side of Mark Rocker. Didn't mind him as a player too much, but. Other than that, I can't see a case for anyone else at all. And even Mark Rocker, I can't see the case for. Max Ferber, would he improve you know, on Pascal or um, Joe Rodon? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the optics of it aren't great either, you know, in terms of, you know, I know not everything should be decided on optics, but for me, all the 
all the fan, you know, how good does the club feel right at this moment in time? Yeah, we've got a connection again between players and fans, and that can get lost very, very quickly. You know, not to put too think, much uh, on uh, it. Oscar, Oscar, just to add to that point, that is, it's really massive, isn't it? Because it's something that, you know, I know Gabe's a stat guy, and I also like to incorporate them, um, you know, every now and again in, in points that I make, but. You really can't measure that, can you? The 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 feel of Leeds United, right? And it feels like for me a new era, a new dawn at the club. Not to be too cliche, but it really does. And and at this moment in time, you feel like the bad feeling was almost like I just left the club in the summer, and Leeds really had to scrape to get back to any sort of like modicum of success. Really, you know, in the championship in terms of wins and stuff like that, and putting consistency together. So, I, I really do agree with you. And, and I, just to add to your point before you go a little bit further, I think that's one of those things that we can't always say. You know, that's the oh, reason you can't measure that. that. But but you, but you know, it's something we can't measure. It's 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 um it's something that is just there and in the air. But you do wonder if Farker has sort of pinpointed that and maybe this this contrasting report that's come out about Rocker and Christensen, it's likely that Leeds want to be getting rid of them in the summer, is sort of a, a, an add-on to that, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the example I'd always go back to, and it's, it's quite a current example, is Burnley. You know, say with Vout Veghorst in the summer, I'm not sure if either of you two read up about this, but he came on in a pre-season friendly after he, you know, jumped ship to go to, I think it was Wolfsburg and then to Man United last season. He came on, got absolutely hammered in terms of stick and that lot. And Burnley fans were not happy with Vincent Company for making that decision to bring him back in. And listen, I think Valt Veghorst, if you just look at it through the prism of Valt Veghorst, the footballer, would he have improved, improved Burnley this season? Absolutely, he would have done. Would he have been an improvement on anyone else they've had up front this season? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Would he have got goals for Burnley this season? Probably. But, and that's a player who I think, you know, would have improved Burnley. I'm looking at the other players at Leeds at this moment in time, would any of them improve the team and the optics of it are as bad as what the Veghorst ones were at Burnley? I just don't see how it ends well, that particular scenario. I'm not saying they won't come back or they will come back. I don't know. I don't think any of us know, to be honest. I think that's something that it obviously depends on the league we're in as well. You know, if we're in the Premier League and the Championship, it's two very different, you know, discussions. You know, do I think people like Max Ferber could perform in the Championship? Yeah, absolutely. As much as uh, frustrated that he moved on in the in the summer, you could definitely do a job in the championship, but that's a different discussion. You know, in the Premier League, you know, that, that's another thing to co- kind of factor into it. But we've seen well, I've got, I've got, well, I've got a question for you. If the fan base can accept, including me, you and Gabe, if if we can accept Willie Nonto back, who was one of the first to almost voice concern and wanting to leave Leeds United, and there's a lot of discourse there, negative discourse, why couldn't we accept a? I'm playing devil's advocate here, but why couldn't we accept a Maximilian Verba back? It's a fair point. It's, it's definitely a fair point. Um, I, I think I mentioned the word optics already. I think, you know, football's a very fine line, you know, isn't it? You know, listen, if Nonto's move had gone through, the narrative would be so, so different on Wilfred Nonto. You know, he'd have probably gone to Everton and it wouldn't have worked out for him because, you know, he's seen players go to Everton and not work out for him. And, 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 also, and, and also, Oscar, just to add to this point by my, by Jeff here, Nonto didn't leave, did he? Well, he would have left. <laughs> and that's, yeah, what, that's no, what we're course, talking yeah. about, isn't it? And sometimes yeah. that, that is life. I mean, it's a bit like saying, you know, um, say if, I don't know, um, Jermaine Beckford had left in 2009 and we didn't have him in 2009, 2010. You know, what would the optics be you know, on Jermaine Beckford? You know, had he not got the goals against Man United and Bristol Rovers? That is football. You know, it's decided in moments you know, and, and things like that. And it's how you respond to things like that that's the biggest thing. But the fact the moves went through, you know, that's a totally different you know, argument, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but you've got the other side of it as well. You know, Jack Harrison... Yeah, obviously his mum at the Everton Everton Burnley game, I think it was. Listen, I'm not going to start a massive rant against Jack Harrison's mum or anything like that. You know, how many times have we seen this? Uh, it's, one, yeah. it's fuel to the fire, though, isn't it? It's fuel to yeah, the fire yeah. for fans. Yeah, it's not ideal when you have got someone flashing a phone in your face, but it's not great, is it? It doesn't look no. great. Um, you know, there's, there's no question about that, and and that's the other side of it. You know. Some of the things Brendan Harrison said in the press as well, I just don't really see a case for it. I, I just think the Leeds United that we're building now, you know, we have given players second chances, you know, obviously none to a second chance. Um, and and that's the thing, you know, did Max Verber want the second chance? Was he that bothered that he left when we were mid-table in the Championship at the start of the season and he took the move? You know, 
it's one of those. You know, it's definitely a fair point with Nonto. And maybe in time, if they did come back and started well, I think the big thing would be in terms of performances. But I just don't see people like Max Verber kicking a ball for Leeds again. I just don't see it. You know, that's the thing. I, I just don't see how... I'd say the word optics again, but the optics of it would be so bad. They just would, and that's and that's what you got. Look, I know not every decision can be made just on that, but Oscar, Oscar, can I can it I undermine just... so much of what we built? If we went Oscar. up this season and then just started doing things like that, I just think it undermines us massively. I I agree, mate. I completely agree, and um, I can see um, sort of like rage or something of the of that emotional sort of. Uh, wave going through Gabe's head now. I've seen him just writing a few points down. And what I've learned about Gabe is he'll just take a second and write a few things down like that. He'll know a few not, things. It's not down. to contradict Oscar because I agree with him. But but, the, 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 but he's getting redder and redder and redder as this conversation is going on. The comments are coming in. So before Gabe goes off on a, a tirade, thing before, can I, can I, you, you, you just, let me just thank you, Stephen Ward, for becoming a, a member. Shout out to you, Steve. Hope you're all good. Go on, Oscar. Finish Your it off. Your tardiness is fine. I genuinely message. don't wish... On out of the least players that left, there's, there's maybe maybe one or two who are genuinely wish, you know, in terms of that the career goes downhill now. But the other ones would say, <laughs> listen, not like in a really bad way. Just venom, like, venom flop, Oscar, just a flop and stuff like that. I'm, not, I'm not talking about injuries and stuff like that. I'm just saying like flop and have bad performances on the pitch and you know. But most yeah. of the players, listen, they took the moves because what they thought was best for their career. But you can't have the cake and eat it. You can't then come back. You know, you made this decision. They made the decision. <laughs> you can't then come. You can't have your cake and eat it. That, that's just my view. You know, you can't then expect the fans to accept you again once you've made your decision. It, that is it, you know, in terms of my view on it. The, in my estimation, the biggest thing that we forget about collectively as a fan base, and we're not the only one. There are fan bases all across the UK and in other countries that forget about something. When you get relegated, the club has to move money unless it wants to take those parachute payments and just sink them into player salary, right? And in weekly wages. So what you do is for the players you can move, you go to them and say, hey, listen, do you want to stay here? Or else they arrange something really quickly for them. There, there could be players, I don't know who, but there could be players that were quite keen on staying. Actually, I know one player, uh, Max Vober seemed pretty keen on staying. And then an opportunity presented itself and our opportunity to offload a one season investment of two and a half million quid presented itself when we took it. So I want, I want to just remind everybody of this, that there are certainly, and we don't know the psychology of the players, but there are certainly players who in their comments can uh, about the club can reveal that they don't want to be here. Right. And that's fine. They should never come back. There are also going to be players that were moved on into loan opportunities so the club didn't have to eat those wages and overpay players that weren't aren't Premier League quality and aren't really championship quality. So it's not not every single loanee is a rat. I, I want to put that out there that in many cases, in order to help the club, I'm not saying that's why they made the decision, but we would not be in a strong position going into the market if most of these players stayed. I just want to throw a couple stats out at, at you here. So Ethan Ampadu <laughs> is getting paid 2 million quid a season, or euros a season, excuse me. Kamara, one. Byram, one. Nanto, less than one. Piro, why is less Am than why one. Is that, why is Ampadu getting paid in euros? No, this is just uh, just the, the projection. He's not getting oh, paid right. in euros. But it's, <laughs> so, it's, so confused. It's where they have the details. It's a European site. Um, right. and Somerville, because of the contract we have him on is getting paid less than, uh, um, than a million a season. Right. Mm. So combine all those players together and how good we've been and then tell me, all right, let's say Mark Rocca said, maybe he's a bad example because Connor would say yes, but most fans, <laughs> if Mark Rocca said, Hey, I'm, I'm firmly committed to staying. I'm thinking, well, we're going to have to pay these, uh, these wages in a lower division. Brendan Aronson at two and a half million. Nope, out the door. Let's loan him. Jack Harrison, 5.8 million a season. Get him out of here. Uh, Max Vober, two and a half. I don't know. I'm pretty happy with paying 500,000 pounds to an on loan um, Joe Rodon. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, Diego Urente, two and a half million. So, any way you splice it, you're getting seven or eight players for the price of, price of three uh, of the way it is. So, all this to say that. 
they've proven they're not Premier League players. So for that reason, I don't want them back. Really? Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair point. Yeah. Do you think? That, yeah. That's yeah, my yeah, first point. Say, that's my first do. point. Interesting. The second point is they're too expensive for us to keep on, on the wage bill anyway. I would rather reinvest that, um, that money into players that are either proven at the top flight or show more potential. You don't always get it wrong with, uh, sorry, you don't always get it right with scouting, but I have a lot more confidence in this group led by Hammond than I did uh, in Victor Orta. That's number two. Number it's like three. Hammond, it's like Hammond's going into battle led by <laughs> Hammond. It's like John Hammond creating a new Jurassic Park and just lining up the best dinosaurs. Um, we do need to get rid of these players somehow. So, you know, right. it's like the Hammond. third point I will say, the third point is, I know, listen, I know, I get it. We don't like Leeds United of all fan base doesn't like it when anybody ever says or implies that they're saying no to us. But sometimes it's just principle. Stay in their wages or halved. Nope, they weren't, they wouldn't be halved. Nope, because they all had like you have to nowadays, by the way, DFG, this is actually a reasonable point to make. In the past, this was the case. But most players now, especially when you sign for a relegation threatened club, will have it baked into their contract that either the, A, they have a release clause, or B, they have a, a wage fixture in there. So that's why you have to move them on because you're moving on their wages. They're still I, on the did, did on not, did United we, did, long term. Did we, not, did we not have that? Um, did we not have the thing that if these players, if we were to go down in a lot of the contracts when they were signed for Leeds, it'd be like 30, 40% of the contract will be slashed? Slashed yeah. if we were to go so, down. Some of them have that 100%. And again, yeah. so DFG is right in the sense that for the money, 100% yeah. right. But remember, let's look at another league uh, uh, league team who's in the EF, EFL right now. Let's look at Sunderland. Sunderland was saddled with huge wage bills for some of those players, and they couldn't get rid of them. They had wage bills for players that did not want to play no matter what. So loans are advantageous to temporarily clearing the books. And yeah, you need a cultural restart, but it just doesn't. I don't like the broad painting strokes that everybody who went out on loan is some kind of rat. It's just not true. No, that, we, there's no way of knowing that. They can't expect to get Wilkins back with open arms at the same time. You know, they right. made the decision to leave when we were in they our did. low point. You, they did, but, also, but it also does advantageous work for the club in some cases when they go on loan. I'll tell you what. I'm, I would think if Diego Urente, if I saw him in the street, I would thank him for going to Roma. I would. I'd say, hey, listen, I'm so glad this kickstarted your career. Now we're going to be able to sell you on. I wouldn't say these words to him. He punched me in the face. But the point being, like, I would have nothing against Diego Urente because he's put us in a position where we can move forward. Some of these players like Aronson have done just as poorly at Union Berlin, and there's no way we sell him on for anything. So, other than so, the so, 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 okay. So if we're not hitting everybody with this broad sort of stick then – um, in terms of the, quiet, uh, the player quality, and we were speaking just a little bit earlier on, and you said it, and Oscar agreed with you, that um, you know these are not Premier League players. But we've also said multiple times this season that Daniel Farker has brought the best out of a lot of these players in terms yeah. of development, but formation as well, a different style of football to what we had in terms of the absolute chaos that it was last season. Let's be honest, chaos. And a lot of these players probably got into a style of football of which they hadn't played before. I'm going to use Mark Rocker, but it's not just because I like him. Um, it's just because a lot of the others were brought in, you know, um, in terms of the, the Jesse Marsh system and stuff like that. So is there not is there not an argument that if we were to say Verber or Rocker as a, as a combo in a different system, because their loans have gone relatively well? Rocker hasn't anymore. He's been benched. Well, he has been benched, but over, I mean, you know, he nearly got back into the Spain squad relatively. He's had a very, very decent season. I have seen he's, Connor he's in the up. Real Betis um, forum. <laughs> Listen, if, 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 if we had... Real, what, he has no idea what he's doing, the old man. <laughs> well, okay, I'll use, I'll use, I, I won't use, I won't use Rocker because I'll get hammered. Um, but Ver, but Verba, let us have a Very Connor with his love for Rocker. Yeah, but, but as an example, is there not an argument there that when a player is done relatively well in a loan spell, that we could bring him back and he could do well in the Premier League? Because it's not like Verbo was horrendous in the Premier League, it's was it? Point, but I'm, I won't use that word and use it before again. But the analogy I'd have for it is your partner's left you for someone else whilst you're in your low <laughs> point, kind of thing. It's not right? like. <laughs> But it is. It is. It's so. not. Hey, let it's him land, not. Gabe. Gabe, I want to hear it. Let him land. Go on. All right, go on. No, and then I'm going to tell him why it's not not the case. Go on. And then you've got yourself sorted out. You know, you've got a six pack. You know, you've got money in the bank. You know, <laughs> things are looking up. 
all of a sudden they want to come back to you. Yeah, well, it doesn't work like that, does it? Uh, but this isn't yeah. a relationship. We pay these folks. It'd be like if you were dealing. Well, Some I can't say, can I say that like, word? Can I say you know? uh, blank worker? If you were playing a blank worker for money and then they went to somebody else for more money, then they came back to you and said, hey, I'll take your money now. Yeah, that's the equivalent. That's the equivalent. But it's not a relationship. They, they don't hang out, come to Leeds United just because they love Leeds United. We've seen academy players who say they never want to play for another club move on to other teams for the money. So, I mean, come on. This is a business. This is primarily. The, it's a business proposition. That's why they've gone to keep, keep their wages. Some of them, I'm sure, thought to reclaim their careers. But the way I see it is this. On a footballing ability, they've already proven they're not up to Premier League quality. And the second thing I'll say, system agnostic, there are thousands of other players who are thriving in those other leagues they may have gone to, or hundreds in this case, uh, that we could draw from and get transfer fees for. So I, I guess I would rather, if the, we can get permanent moves away for some of these guys, do it. Um, Jack Harrison, maybe we can recoup the money we spent from Brendan Anderson. We're never going to get that money back. Can, we may as we well talk, find the loss. Can, can we talk? Can we talk on him? He's he's probably the most interesting one of them all, really, Aronson, because you can almost see like a way out for a lot of them, even when you're um, pulling in uh, the worst right back I think I've ever seen at the club in Rasmus Christensen. But if you if you if you're looking at all of them, you can see a way out. Really, Brendan Aronson is one where you are a little bit like, I mean. Is he going to have to come into the fold next season for Leeds to just raise any stock whatsoever? You're going to send him on loan again, Connor. It's almost like a youth team player. Uh, um, if you're going to try to break break into the team it will, as a Premier League team, I cannot see. I I would think it would be foolish. Farco would truly have to be a miracle man if you'd bring that player in and expect to trust even as a bench option. No way for me. I'd send him out again to an, another situation. Maybe uh, he, he goes to another league. That's a little bit easier uh, um, physicality wise. Ultimately, Brendan Aronson, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, will never be a Leeds United player and he will never be a Premier League player, or maybe even thrive in the English system. Could he be good other places? Maybe, who knows? I'm starting to think that his earlier good performances were flashes in the pan because it was only a season or two, right? And I think that it's easy to look at a couple matches against Bayern Munich and say, oh, that's fantastic. He had great games. He had a great game against Chelsea. Ultimately, I don't think he's a Leeds United player. I don't think that having him in the fold does him any good or us any good from a business point of view. We have to send him to a place, if anybody will have him, where he can recoup some value so we can ultimately sell him. I just I, the other I, thing I, is, sorry, go on, Oscar. To get gonna... Aaron into the team, you've got to drop probably the most popular player in the whole squad and, you know, and amongst the fan base in Gigi Rutter to get him anywhere near the team. Yeah, uh, 57, 57 minutes in, he almost didn't get the GG Russ of it in there. But yeah, you've, you've done well. Eight minutes away from Russ there to get Aronson in the team. It's just, it's not a good look. And it just does, A, it doesn't work on the pitch. And it's not a great look in terms of the way you want the club to go morally. Can I, can I ask you as well? Like, and, and listen, debate, discussion is what we love. And, and hopefully you guys, when you come to these shows with us three, there is a, you know, you really, you really get engaged. And I can tell with the comment section that you really are. There's a lot of you in, there's only 1,200 live viewers in. The, the, it's getting increasing every week. So thank you so much. Let me make sure you like the video, subscribe as well. Extensive content on the Patreon. But I, I wanted to um, touch on this comment, which I find interesting. DFG's putting some really good comments in tonight. Yes. Rocker, Boba, Cox, Cine, and Adams were okay. Rasmus and Aronson were rubbish. Ampadu, Kamara, Grev, Rodon are at least as good as uh, those who left. Now, I'm going on a different angle with this. Is it fair to judge devil's advocate promoting discussion? You guys can shoot me down here completely. Is it fair to judge Rocker, Verba, Cox, Cine, Adams, all of this lot against Ampadu, Kamara, Gruev, and Rodon right now when the latter, sec the latter selection are all playing championship football and they haven't yet to make that step up pl and play regular games for Leeds United in the top division, the best division in the world. And I'm not being negative there. I'm really, really not being negative. I'm trying to just be realistic. Do you think it's right to compare until we are there? No, there's no direct comparison un until we are there. There's no, there's no question about that. But... If we're talking about, if you're talking about, in, say if, okay, say if all them players on that list, apart from obviously Sinistera and Adams, because they're obviously gone permanently, say the other three, all right, the other four or five players on that list are in the squad next season in competition with the likes of Kamara, Grev and Rodon. There is no case for them to play ahead of, ahead of the other four because they lost that right when they left Leeds in the first place. For me, just in terms of 
you got. I know the stats and stats. no, but the comment, the, com- the 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 comment is it's we're okay and we're rubbish. So I'm talking about their ability. Right. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. Talk- I, I, I'm, you know, this. I think even like Sinistera, I thought he was okay for us, but I thought he could go up another level. I thought all those players were better than what they showed on the pitch. You know, th- there's no question about that. Yeah, you know, I don't think every single player on that list is a bad player. In fact, I think most of them are okay players. But... And, and, Os- and Oski, you look at the, that that five. You look at that five. I'm playing dad- devil's advocate. Please don't go nuts at me in the comment section here. I have to just say this. But you look at those five, the first the first names there that DFG's put up, you would expect them all in a bit of a better system, a Daniel Farker system, to really, really thrive in the championship. And we're just making speculative comments here. It's hypothetical. Well, Timmy, we saw it. We saw it, right? Look, but, I don't yeah. like to say this because I don't, I don't think he's... I don't know him personally, obviously. So this is only through what I've seen and observed. I probably wouldn't want Luis Sinistero on my team. That no, said, no, no, he's no. better than anybody we have on, on yeah, our team yeah. currently. Yeah. That's and for me. Could that's I just say impact. people said what two players I'm referring to? It might be the two players that ended up on the south coast. That's all I'll hint that I was yeah. that I was alluding to. They they are the two players who I thought. No, they went. I know too it's far. been fun and invoked to pretend Tyler Adams wasn't good at anything before he got injured, but uh, um, the reality is that he was one of our. And I know it's not saying a lot, but he's been a consistent, strong performer his entire career, both as an international and as a as a Bundesliga and Premier League player. So you know, I think that we need to apply some context here. But okay, all right. But, if Adams say if Adams, you know. It turns out he was forced out. The, I'm not saying he obviously wasn't forced out the club, but he he left. Well, he's on not loan. coming back. He's been sold, right? right. Say if yeah. he could come back, okay. Right. Yeah, you know, if he'd only gone out on loan, and it turns out that Farker didn't want him. Just use that hypothetical, okay? You've got Adams back in the squad, decent popularity. Would you still want him starting over Ampadu and Gray in midfield? The answer for me is still no. It's still no. I, I don't see you know, what on the ball, what does he offer that Ampadu and Gray can't? You know, off the ball, listen, he's an exceptional player, but in terms of what we're trying to build, I still prefer having Ampadu and Gray What I would say is Ampadu's stats against similar competition are similar to Adams' at that level, and uh, his stats and possession have only gone up when he's faced lesser competition. And ultimately, you know, we have some head-to-head statistics. Ampadu's better on the ball than Tyler Adams. Come on, mate. The data tells you that's not true. The data tells you that it's indistinguishable at level competition. I don't know. I've never seen Adam Tyler Adams play the championship. I can tell you that when Ampadu's played in the championship, he's looked a lot better on the ball than when he did in the Premier League or in, or in Serie A. Now, of course, he was split in two different positions, like he's been at Leeds United uh, in both of those leagues. But their numbers were almost exact. Uh, we did this analysis in the beginning of the season. Their numbers were almost exactly the same in those uh, in those uh um at the, the same level of competition so you know at what, look at he's what not stage, coming back uh, tyler adams question, he's, he's it, not a leader at what stage in tyler adams's career has he looked elite on the ball has that been a big strength of his on the ball well if we could go back in time and put him in the championship i would say that i'd say in mls he looked elite on the ball and a couple of times for the United States, he's looked a lead on, on the ball because he's faced lesser you know, competition. You don't think Ampadu next season, it, say if we went up, he wouldn't look good on the ball in Premier League? I'm not going to speculate. I'm going to tell you ball. what I've seen. I've I've seen him look good on, on what the data says, and he looks good on the ball at in the championship. Could he look good on the ball in the Premier League? He could. He hasn't in the past. He's had his opportunities, and he didn't cash in. So we'll see. I, I believe in Ethan Ampadu. I think he's a class midfielder. And I think in the Daniel Farka system, he's better suited to some of the systems he's played in before but if we're making direct comparisons all we can do is compa- uh, compare based on the facts and the data otherwise we're just speculating and so any any uh, answer i could give be i like i really tyler adams is probably my favorite one well certainly first bit of the season he's probably my favorite player in the league team by a distance by the way i thought he was head and shoulders in the first bit of the season above every other release player and probably the only reason why we won some games in the first bit of the season but i never once thought to myself he looks like a player who Wow, you know, he's absolutely breathtaking on the ball. I never got that feeling from him. It was always about what he did off the ball. And the would you describe Bamford as breathtaking on the ball in the championship? Yeah, I'd say some really you would use that syntax. He's breathtaking on the ball. You know, we we had a video that we almost released. There was a period of four to five games in the months of November. He had a bad run, he had a bad run in a 46 game season, right? But but the point is, he's never looked breathtaking. I mean, I think you're I think that's hyperbole. He's looked good, he's good on the ball. At this level, he's on, so when you see him actually play passes over the top into Bamford with his weaker foot on, yeah. you know, on the nail, you know, you, when you he, when he's getting four or five 
now it sounds, but you're making me be in a position where it sounds like I'm criticizing Empadu because you're using inflated language. You can say that a player has been really good on the ball and it's exceeded expectations without saying that he's been breathtaking as if he's a world-class central midfielder because he's had no, a good season in the championship. At this level, let's say he's, he's levels for Right, me, but that's a different level, comment to say at this I still level. Think at the league level, I think it carries through. I think I have no question about it. I think Ampadu is the player out of everyone in the league squad and most confident by a distance. Makes I'd agree. I'd agree. A, he has physical attributes in a position like uh, Connor and I were talking about this the other day, that if positionally his versatility I have no doubt that he could be a good Premier League player. I just tend to to go with, I have data that supports X and data that doesn't support Y. And Connor, what the question was at this point, you know, for, you know, we're projecting. It's it's all a confidence projection. I'd rather just stick with, I'm going to stick with praising him for the level he's at and saying, I'm wait, for me, wait and see next season. I, I hope he does. I hope he takes it up a level in the Premier League based off his prior performances. And they haven't been poor, but they haven't been nearly what they've been when he's been in the championship. Fair point. Do you need to jet off, mate? I do, <laughs> I do actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gabe is exiting the building after that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, see you in a bit, mate, and uh, we'll catch you on the other side. All righty. See you later, mate. Bye, Bye guys. Mate. Cheers. There you go. We're all wow, on, uh, I will never say Tanner Adams isn't like the second coming of Boost Gets ever again. No, we've had we've had a few debates on it as well. I, I have to, and, and Gabe, I no. Tanner that. Adams, listen, as much as I can't stand the way he left the club, you know, and Anson and Stara, they're the two players that I really look back on and think, you know, they should have been, especially Adams, I thought it was a real opportunity for him to be the leader of, of something brilliant, you know, in terms of, you know, under American ownership, new manager coming in, <laughs> I think he could have gone on to be some, a really, really top player at this club, but I'm not going to cry over spilt milk. You know, at the end of the day, you know, Gray's gone into that position, ampadu has gone into that position, and for me, it's been better players than what Tyler Adams is. I, I do genuinely think that, and at their age profiles as well, I think they're only going to get better. I just think the profile of player that Tyler Adams is is a very useful player, even at Premier League level. But there's a ceiling on it. He's not going to. I don't think he's ever going to be a top ten club player kind of thing you know i think he's always gonna be a player who's playing for teams that are struggling at the back, bottom end of the table you know and will he get in the bottom of the team when he's fit you know that's another debate yeah and i think as well like you know you look at ampadu in comparison to adams ampadu's stint at premier league level was was really suffocated in 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 the defensive department really he was a center back for sheffield united i think he was 19 at the time 18 19 at the time um and he was thrown into it really in, in a team that wasn't exactly expansive on the ball and chris um, wilder's not known for being the best player well the best manager in the world with young players is he let's be honest no he's not and i don't think he's i don't think he wanted to you know i don't think you saw the expression of, of ethan ampadu there whereas we've seen tyler adams at that top level um, you know, and I think we can safely say Mark Rocker was deemed in that pivot as the the, the ball player. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I agree with you. I think you know when you just watch the game, and I've said this to Gabe, and this is where me and Gabe clash a little bit when it comes to the data and stuff. When I watch a game, you can just literally see left foot, right foot, uh, mid to range, mid range passing, long long range passing in particular. So I think Adams Adams was probably much of the Gruevs, you know, short passing, very decent, lateral balls, ticking it over. Um, yeah, he'd express himself maybe maybe a little bit more going forward every now and again. But I think when you look at the passing range and accuracy of Ethan Ampadu, um, he's he's more more than um, better on the ball than uh, than uh, he's much much better on the ball than, than Tyler Adams. But listen, it's uh, it's not his part of the game. But listen, mate, uh, have you have you got your uh, league standings there? Obviously, how you think it will it'll end. So what? So it, it, I guess I guess briefly, just uh, give us sort of a, an ending on on your table, mate. Um, okay, your, your okay. One moment, guys, one moment. I'm going to get the called even more delusion now. Um, no, it's like, do you want me to read a few comments up before you before you get it up? Yeah, let's um, go. Let's, um, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah, Renda says I'm glad Adams has gone, but agree with Oscar. It was the perfect moment for Adams to take the lead. Um, top banana, well said. Uh, stats aren't everything. Yeah, but stat, we've got to we got to give Gabe Gabe a bit of credit there. You know, like he, he watches the. That's why we get Gabe on the debrief. You know, Gabe, you watch the game differently to me, Oscar. Um, and and Gabe is is a very analytical man when it comes to football, so he will judge. I don't think the, he was bad on the ball, ball, Adams, by any stretch. No, he wasn't bad. Yeah, I don't think he was like. I don't think teams were looking at Adams. I don't think we signed him because because we thought, oh, he is some ball player midfielder. We bought him in because no. we thought 
he will go alongside Mark Rocker and compliment him. Yeah, in yeah, the yeah. end, it didn't work out, but that that seems to be the idea behind it. And there and there is an argument to say as well when Adams went out, Rocker's performances went down the drain as well. So yeah, yeah. Um, go on then, mate. Read out your uh, no, your league standings then. Fourth and up, fourth upwards. Fourth, fourth and up, yeah. Okay, fourth. I've got Southampton on ninety points. Third. Bad end, a, bad, a bad end to the season for Southampton. Dodgy, bad end. Dodgy end. Dodgy end. Um, yeah. Third, I've got Ipswich, ninety-two points. Oh, you've had you've got a few bad results in there for Ipswich as well. Just just as if you are joining right now, I've I've got Southampton in fourth on ninety-four and Ipswich in third on ninety-six. So yeah, oh, go on. Only four points. No, it's, not it's a lot bad. now, mate. Four points is a lot now. That different. Um, I might have inflated some of these. This is. Oh dear me, this is so. Uh... Okay, uh, Oscar, Oscar, just just a little bit here, mate. Don't dismiss Gabe's view. There's a fine point between data passion my way. They need to be hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. We're saying, yeah. we, please, IPW, listen to what we're saying. We are completely saying that Gabe's point is as valid as mine, and Oscar's hundred percent. And he could be right. We are just saying we're just giving an alternate point of view. Me and Gabe have argued multiple times over this, and his his opinion stands up. So yeah, hundred percent. We're not dismissing it whatsoever. Can I just say that we're not dismissing? We don't dismiss any opinion on here. We've just been speaking about Furpo in central attacking midfield. For goodness' sake. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> go on, mate. Um, right. So second, this is yep. where I'm going to get hooks. This is where I'm going to get called leads by a scum at this oh, point. Now. Oh dear. Second, I've got Leicester, 97 points. So you've got Southampton on 90. You've got Ipswich on 92. You've got Leicester on how much was that? 97. 97, okay. And then what have you got? Who's who's left by energy? It's not West Brom, is it? Going on a surge. Well, you know, Carlos Corbram, Michael Johnson, <laughs> that, is, that is a combination and a half. First, Go I've on. got Leeds. How many points right. did you have Leeds on? I had Leeds on... I've had Leeds finishing second on a hundred points. Oh, so it's not that different. I've got no. Leeds first on the hundred and four. <laughs> <laughs> this is why right. I don't, don't want to finish on hundred and four points. By the way, Yo, this <laughs> I mean, I mean, I have to say, I have to say, it's four points ahead of me. But like, it's, it's like what you said at the start with Southampton when I was, when you said I've got them on ninety, and I went, I've got them on ninety-four, and you went, yeah, it's only four points. What's four <laughs> points? <laughs> Wow. Okay. So um, I don't. I don't think that, I, I said to you before. I don't think the table will finish like that. It's just based purely on one by one predictions of those games. That's what I've gone with. Um, so where? Yeah. So where? Do, where do you see it? Just in your sort of in your fixture pile up there. Where do you see the winners and the losers? Like where do you see, for example, Leeds just striding away? That there can't be many draws in there. It's just got to be a lot of wins, no losses. I think. What I'd say is that Easter weekend, I agree, is key. I think this weekend's key as well. If we, if we win the next three on the bounce, yeah. I, I just think the table, with the fact that you know Leicester are only playing two games in that, in that time yeah, frame. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's games yeah. in hand, but it's congested end of the season for them. They've got to obviously play Samps in that spell. It's with Samps to play each other on the 1st of April. So that's at the same time we play Hull. There's a very decent chance we could be a few points clear. I don't think... Listen, we won't get 104 points. We will drop more points than that. I look at the Middlesbrough. I look at the Middlesbrough and QPR away games. You know, the two penultimate games for Southampton is very dodgy. I think our last three games are very dodgy. You know, Middlesbrough away, you don't want to be going there needing to win. But I think if we go to Middlesbrough away with a cushion, I think the mindset's totally different. If we go to Middlesbrough away a point ahead of the rest, it's a very, very difficult situation that all of a sudden. So, well, unbe- 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 unbelievable hard. Unbelievable. <laughs> it could mean anything. Doesn't have to mean the obvious. Um, if we match the form um, of last nine uh, in next, it's 104 with Leicester 98, and which is Ipswich. Apart from Ipswich, that's kind of bang on. Then really, you've you've gone pretty much. I do on think. Form. Yeah, I'm not sure on points. I'm not sure on order. I do think the top two will be the two L's, um, Leeds and Leicester. I do, I do genuinely think that. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, I'm only like sort of 60 40 on this. I'm not saying, oh, it's absolutely out of the question that Ipswich and Samson will get top two. I'm not saying that at all. As I said. So, where do you see, just out of interest, so you've got Leeds and Leicester. So, where do you see, because that is a, that's a massive, that is Ipswich five points out when it comes to Leicester. And that is, that is Ipswich from being a point behind right now. That's Leeds gaining a 12 point advantage um, on, <laughs> on Ipswich. So, so, where do you, what, are Ipswich just falling Listen, off? A I couldn't bit come onto this video. I went, I went a bit more positive because I could not come onto this video and say, oh, <laughs> what, I did the predictions. Leeds, you're going to finish on 79 points. 
You know yeah. what I mean? I couldn't go and do that at the same time. So, yeah, I, I did inflate it. I did go for eight wins and then draw from the last nine, which isn't going to happen. We're not we're not going to do this, guys. I'm telling you now. Yeah. Um, we're going to win but all nine. You- but have you, have, are you looking at sort of sort of where um, Ipswich just in terms of your fit? Was it the sort of Norwich game where they start yeah, to maybe the fall game, off? The whole game as well. The, the okay, well, right. Yeah, they were the two decisive ones for me. I, I did feel, um, and obviously Samson at home as well. I had it as the yeah, draw yeah. with you as well, Samson. Yeah. I think, yeah, it was similar games. I think, um, I think it was it Norwich. Still, no, it wasn't Norwich. Still playing. Um, uh, if I had the whole thing up, I'd be able to tell you. But there was certainly certainly the Ipswich Southampton games. I saw his draws. South, Southampton, say, Southampton have got Leicester away as well. They've got yeah, Cardiff, that Leicester game Cardiff and away. Southampton Middlesbrough as well. And I think he gave those as draws too. But listen, it's the next two or three weeks. It could easily it, it could easily flip quite easily. This if we go on like a win of one, a run of one win from three, it will go totally the other way. You know, these, these next three or four games are going to be so key to just setting the pace now. The rest of the season, um, well, I think as well, Oski, you look at sort of um, uh, Ipswich's start of April, it's it's Southampton at home and it's Norwich away, so yeah. you know, it's what we're talking about at the start. The start. Break. You, if, if you're, but even if you're to lose those two games, I think you're done, you're done. I think if you don't win one of those two games, you've you've, you've got a mountain to climb, and that's yeah. that's probably the reason why I had. It's which a bit further adrift, and mm-hmm. I don't think it will be a difference like that. I think I said to you before. I think the gap between either us and Leicester and Ipswich and Samson will be minimal by the end of the season. Um, that is absolutely mad, by the way. And maybe that, maybe that's a bit of karma. You know, when I was talking about Bournemouth before, you know, who knows, who knows? You know, some would say it, some wouldn't. You know, it's it's, it's interesting, but um, but yeah, it it will be tight come the end of the season. But I do think it will be us and Leicester in the top two. Yeah, I'd say 64 at this moment in time. But listen, we could drop points against Millwall. Millwall have won four on the bounce on to Neil Harris. You know, that's not going to be an easy game. And then straight away, you're thinking, all right, if we went into the international break off the back of dropping points against Millwall, the narrative is totally changing. It is. So it is really the next three or four weeks which are going to really decide a lot of things, really. But um, I just don't want to be going to Middlesbrough QPR because we know what our record is in QPR in London. <laughs> Penultimate game of the season, needing things, you know, needing results. Yeah, I think, I think the, I think the positive for me there is I used to think a little bit on superstition when it came to QPR, but then we did what we did to Millwall at the start of the season, where we just never win. I'm um, just convinced we won't score. It. I, I, don't, I can't remember the last time we scored at QPR. Never mind one. I, I think it was the roof yeah. hat trick on the Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Mate, look at the teams that we brought there. Come on. Um, yeah, that's true, that's true. But listen, we went there with Pablo and Click and KP in that lot. KP got sent off. I'd still yeah. say, I'd still say, look at the team we have now. I really, yeah, really yeah, yeah I know, I know. But I, I yeah. actually, you know, I say all this, but I had us down to win at QPR, so you know, it's. Uh... <laughs> Um, all right, mate, let's leave it there. It's been a bumper episode. I hope you guys have enjoyed. There's over, there's 1,200 of you in the building. Please make sure you like before you leave. Would really appreciate that. Comment as well afterwards. I'm going to read all the comments and try to comment back to you guys as well. Make sure you share into all your friends and family and all that good stuff on Facebook. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oscar, thank you so much for joining me, mate. I really appreciate it. And before we end, mate, can I get you a quick score prediction for the weekend? Yeah, of course. Uh, two nil leads I'll go for. Two in a lead, yeah. I've gone two. We won't, we won't win the league by seven points. I'll give you that. <laughs> I, I've said in my predictions, we won't win the league by seven points. Yeah, maybe not a uh, maybe not a twelve uh, point gap between Leeds and Ipswich. Who knows? Swing. Yeah, uh, guys, really appreciate that, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Cheers. 